Hi, I'm Rachel, and this is my Friday Reads for April 26th, 2019. Or at least I'm filming this on Friday, so I'm slowly getting back into the groove of things. <laughs> With that in mind, because I know this is technically belated, I'll try to keep this short and sweet. So the main reason I'm later than I hoped in filming this is that I finally just finished this collection, or several collections, of the selected poems of Langston Hughes, so my National Poetry Month uh, obligation is fulfilled. <laughs> but it's much more uh, meaningful than that. This, this uh, co collection was uh, very emotional, very powerful. Um, I talked about it in some uh, earlier uh, Friday Reads videos, uh, or am reading videos. Uh, I just read about 80 pages to get to the end of the collection, including uh, his collection A Dream Deferred, which uh, seems to refer a lot to uh, how dreams get deferred, uh, oftentimes by lack of money, but also by uh, means of hatred and, and bigotry. He even had a uh, poem in here about uh, the Jewish community in Harlem. and. Uh, seem to express sympathy about how uh, they might be part of that community of people of dreams deferred. So that was quite nice. <laughs> uh, his last poem in here is by far the longest and it seems to be a uh, alternative history uh, or you know a different view of American history. He takes in uh, quotes from uh, famous people, presidents like Jefferson all the way to um, Frederick Douglass talking about freedom, talking about sort of the labor which uh, made this country come to life. It seemed like a very on-the-ground approach in terms of building up the country and also in terms of what freedom means, especially in a slave society, in a, a society that started with slavery. So yeah, I'm really glad that uh, I read this. Uh, it's a very uh, deep and moving collection and uh, I think he has he had such a strong voice. Also this week I finished The Great Believers by Rebecca Mackay, which uh, I read in part because of the Booktube Prize, uh, and earlier this week I posted a review video about this and two other books that were in the uh, Group B of the Octafinals, so uh, I'll link to that to give more complete thoughts. Um, in general, I really loved this book. This was a book about uh, the AIDS crisis in the 1980s, uh, mostly focusing on a community in uh, Chicago and our uh, protagonist, Yale Tishman, who was part of that community, uh, watching his friends die, being in danger himself of uh, this virus that uh, there wasn't uh, much hope for and uh, most of the rest of the world wasn't really caring much about. Uh, there's also a future uh, story, well, a present-day storyline with uh, a woman named Fiona, who was um, Yale's friend and the sister of one of the first uh, men in the story who died, uh, talking basically about her trauma, about, you know, taking care of these, her friends who were dying, and what that was like. Uh, I think that storyline was the weakest because we were seeing it through the prism of her looking for her lost daughter, and it was the least connected to the rest of the story. But overall, I really feel like Mackay was able to flesh out this community uh, and just show who these men were, these men who we lost. And so by the very end, when we're thinking back on their legacy, it's, it's really meaningful and touching. Next, I finished The Last Watchman of Old Cairo by Michael David Lucas. I put this on my Jewish literature published in 2018 list that I wanted to read, and then it got shortlisted uh, for the, or it became a finalist technically, for the Sammy Rohr Prize for Emerging Jewish Writers, and we're going to hear in about a month if he wins or someone else wins. Uh, I think I, this book suffered a little bit coming after reading a couple of really wonderful literary fiction novels. This one was good. I really like the story where it's one of these sprawling epics in a way uh, where uh, we're centered on the Jewish community, particularly in Cairo. Um, there's one storyline that starts in the 11th century around um, a newly renovated synagogue which was recently attacked and uh, the Jewish community is uh, c communing with, uh, you know, the person who's basically in charge of them. But by communing, I mean they're like sending messages back and forth for, with a young boy who's, you know, being the message carrier. And he's so diligent with it that the community decides to offer him the job of watchman. Uh, and it's a good position for this young Muslim boy. He gets more money than he did at home, so he decides to accept. 
uh, and it just uh, it follows him uh, sort of ingratiating with this community. Uh, the next storyline is in the present day with the last watchman, or his last descendant, who uh, a boy named, um, a young man named Joseph, who was actually uh, of both Muslim and Jewish descent. His parents were both uh, connected with the synagogue. His father was uh, a watchman as well. He is now living in uh, Berkeley, but uh, his father dies and uh, gives him some mysterious artifacts from the Geniza, and so he goes uh, back to Cairo to traipse down that story. And then finally, there's a storyline in 1897, which is uh, based on uh, real facts of uh, the people who uh, excavated Geniza's in Cairo to uh, bring that, you know, priceless historical information uh, to, well, to Cambridge to, to be preserved and studied. Uh, and we're following these two twins, uh, middle, middle-aged female twins, uh, Margaret and Agnes, uh, and also uh, Dr. Solomon Schechter, who was a uh, Jewish uh, historian of the time. This is kind of hypocritical of me because I take so long to read things. That's why I get, uh, you know, off of the uh, track of Friday Reads because I don't often have a lot to say week to week sometimes. <laughs> I take too long to read. And this book was relatively short. It was under 300 pages. And yet I feel like that could be a weakness. There just wasn't enough space to, you know, to give breath to these stories. Uh, I feel like uh, the, char the characters could be a little bit uh, one-dimensional sometimes. And the stories didn't have that sweeping sense of history quite as much because there wasn't the page count of, say, uh, The Weight of Ink by Rachel Kadish, which is also up for the saving for a prize. <laughs> I, so I really loved reading the story when I was in it, but I also felt like we were sort of skipping over a lot of stuff. Uh, but at the same time, I think the uh, plot-directed narrative was very compelling, and it was definitely a good read. Slightly future Rachel here. I almost forgot to mention this, but uh, this book also won uh, the National Jewish Book Awards Award for Best Fiction of 2018. And uh, the Jewish Book Council published uh, an interview with Lucas on their website, so I thought I'd link to that below. And in it, he says regarding what he hopes people will take away from the book, I hope every reader takes away from the book what they most need. As far as what I took away from the writing process, the biggest thing was probably a broader understanding of Jewish history in general, and specifically the history of Muslim-Jewish coexistence. And that really stuck out to me as well, because without being uh, moralistic about it in any way, uh, Lucas was able to uh, paint a history where uh, Muslims and Jews were actually able to coexist. And even a present, because, you know, despite broader politics, we see within these, uh, this family that's gone on for a thousand years, this Muslim family of uh, guarding the synagogue, we see, of course, that Muslims and Jews are getting along on that uh, molecular uh, community level. So that was very touching. Next, um, returning to Zelda, which is a biography of Zelda Fitzgerald by Nancy Milford. Uh, I picked this up at the beginning of the month uh, on the uh, suggestion of Lindsay from Lindsay Reads, in fact. And I'd said in one of my earlier videos that I'd try to read a chapter a night. And of course, that went by the wayside very quickly. <laughs> I'm very bad at reading that way, uh, I'm <laughs> except with audiobooks, perhaps. I can do those in little chunks at a time. But for uh, books that I'm reading, I tend to binge them much more often. That works better for me. So that's what I have to do now if I want to finish this book by the end of the month. So uh, we'll see how this goes. I'd, uh, I'm still very invested in it. It's just, uh, you know, finding the time to sit down and do it. Because finally, this is another book I'd like to finish before the end of the month and my book club meeting on the 30th. This is The Un-Americans by Molly Antipol. This is a collection of short stories and it is a reread for me, so hopefully that'll help me out. I decided uh, that when my uh, book club uh, would pick books that I'd already read that I should go ahead and try this rereading concept, especially for short stories because I find that they go out of my head so quickly, I guess, because they're so short. <laughs> I don't know. So I'm hoping that uh, rereading this collection will bring back my memories of reading it for the first time and help uh, keep the stories in my head. I remember really liking the collection before, so I hope that continues.
So that about covers it for me now. Uh, I hope to be back soon, really soon, back in front of this camera to do my author's answer video before uh, the end of the month because uh, I do the author's answer series monthly. And I was tagged in an author tube tag by Steve Donahue. So I'm going to try to mesh those two together and hopefully not make a video that is too ridiculously long. We'll have to wait and see. On Saturday, I will also be going to the DC Public Library's Author Fest Day, <laughs> so that might give me even more to ramble on about, so uh, the, tide, the tides might be against me here, but uh, I'll try to do my best to, to keep things brief but uh, interesting. So thank you so much for watching, everyone, and I'll see you next time.